serious. It was appreciated. All right, I got to throw out some chapstick. And usually by Wednesday, it's my it's targeted throws, right? Each every day because I get requests. Children think I deny them on purpose. And some adults as well. <laughs> wow. No shame, right? You're just, all right, you've taken that from a child. You got a big smile on your face. That's, you seem to be okay with that. All week you've been making fun of me, and now you want, no, no. And I have none for you. There you go. Oh, did, oh he took it. He took it. Don't let it, ba- don't let it bounce, man. I'm going to hide something in there. I'm going to put something in there by, for Sunday. Let's see if we can't scare Dennis. Do you even look in there? No. All right, then I won't hide anything in there. Denying ourselves. This is something that we don't really do in our country anymore, right? We don't deny ourselves much of anything. Like if we want it, we'll go get it. Like a uh, perfect example of this. This morning, I got up and uh, I was like, well, I could eat the breakfast at the Econo Lodge. Or I could drive to Neosho and go to Casey's and get some of their amazing donuts. No way! All right, well, I had to go to Neosho anyway, so. There we go. So I drove over to Neosho. By the way, the Nazarene pastors won't talk to me over there. because I went over there to talk to them and they left. So I went and I got, have you ever had their, uh, the crawl, they're called the crullers? The wrinkled donuts? For whatever reason, Casey's has the best in the world. So I didn't deny myself. I went and had a couple. It was really good. Uh, but we don't, we don't deny ourselves, do we? We're just like, if I want it, I want to go get it. Like, I think people ruin Christmas all the time. Rarely do they wait for Christmas. Like, you become an adult, like, if you want it, you're just like, I ain't going to wait for somebody to give it to me. I'm just going to go buy it, Right? My mom, she's 77. It's been interesting uh, to, to go through this stage of her life. She's 77. She's, she lives with us. She's lived with us for the past 10 years. And just kind of interesting conversations that we have on a daily basis. Like, it, the roles have really reversed. You hear that happens. Like, when I was little, you know, my mom was like, you know, you need to drink milk and take your medicine and go to bed. And now I say the same thing to her. <laughs> drink milk. <laughs> We haven't got to, it's bath night yet, but I'm sure that's coming. You know what I mean? Get in there. Take your bath. <laughs> so we're, we're watching her. We go to the doctor with her. And, and so we're trying to encourage her to take care, better care of herself. Her cholesterol kind of went up a little bit. And, uh, and so my wife is really, my wife is like nurse, nurse Ratchet. I mean, she is just on her about this stuff. And I told my mom, I said, don't mess with her. I said, I used to. And it's just, I don't anymore. She's beat me down. Just... Whatever she says, go along with. And so my wife was talking to her about her cholesterol. And I, at this point, I just listen, right? I got enough problems. I don't need to be in their problems. So I just watch it all. And she said, you just, you need to watch what you eat. And, and, and I told her, so finally I piped up. I said, Mom, you know, I said, she likes chalupas from Taco Bell. Who knew that a 77-year-old would be all about Taco Bell, right? She runs for the border all the time. She loves Taco Bell. And so she said, uh, she said, I said, Mom, you know, you can't eat a chalupa every day. Like, that's her favorite. She loves a chalupa, right? Always. And now I found out she's been going behind her back ordering the Starburst drinks. I, I was like, you're not 12 years old. What are you doing? Oh, my word. I said, Mom, you can't have a chalupa every day, and you certainly can't have a Starburst drink every day. And she ordered one by mistake that was the Mountain Dew drink. This is a woman with a weak heart on nine kinds of blood pressure pressure medicine. Are you kidding me? Yeah, let's just inject a little Mountain Dew into your system. I'm sure that won't bother you. Her heart beat out of her chest. She said, listen, I am not, this is her words, I am not going to deny myself. And I, I appreciate what she's saying. I understand that. I think by the time I'm 77, if I'm fortunate enough to live that long, there are days I don't think I'm going to. But if I'm fortunate enough to live that long, I'm thinking if I'm 77, I'm probably going to go, I'm this close to death, I'm having a chalupa. You know what I mean? So I understand that. But we do. We live in this culture where we don't really want to deny ourselves. It's not a choice. Uh, author, Christian author Stephen Arterburn says this, if you base your life on wanting to feel good, 
Anytime something feels good, you'll believe it's acceptable. He just described our culture. If we believe, if, 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 if the ultimate in life is to feel good, then anything is acceptable. And it's amazing how they say the 80s were self-absorbed. I'm like, the 80s, really? The 80s have nothing on the 2000s. But we live in this culture that it's foreign to deny ourselves. But I want to challenge you tonight that, that you can. And, and that if to, in order to be a true disciple of Christ, it's about making those right choices in order to deny ourselves. One of the best pictures of denial, I think, is in the scriptures, is found in the life of Peter. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. And here's a guy who knew about denial. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Then Peter spoke up. He says, we have left everything to follow you. We have left everything to follow you. We denied it all, Jesus, to follow you. And this is the kind of follower that Jesus is looking for. And the first choice Peter had to make in order to deny himself is he had to choose his identity. He had to choose his identity. Was he going to be Peter or was he going to be a Christ follower? That was his choice. He had to choose his identity. Luke chapter 22, verses 55 through 60. Luke chapter 22, verses 55 through 60. And so here's the scene. They've arrested Jesus, right? And the whole thing is going down, and they're, 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 they're ready to take Jesus to court. And we find this scene with Peter. And it says, when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. See, Peter said, listen, I'm not, I'm not denying myself, man. I'm looking out for Peter right here. And I don't want to be associated with Jesus. Jesus. Because it's going to get me in trouble. And so there is nothing about denying himself in that moment, right? He was all about looking out for him. His identity was this. I'm Peter. I'm not with those guys. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a disciple. I'm not a follower of Christ, man. That will get me in trouble. Then we see in 1 Peter 4, 16, how things have changed. Peter says this, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Something changed. What happened in Peter's life was he denied himself and decided to follow Christ. See, a lot of us read that passage of Scripture in Luke and it it says that if we're we're to take up our cross and follow him, but we leave that denial part out. We don't want to talk about that because that's the part that is the most difficult. But Peter made the choice that if I'm going to be a disciple, if I'm going to be a follower of Christ, then it's no longer about Peter. It's no longer about me. It's going to be my identity in Christ. 1 Peter 1a says this, as he introduces this letter, Peter says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Things have changed. Man, Pentecost comes. I mean, Jesus is, is resurrected, come back to life. They see him. Uh, the Holy Spirit ascends on him. And now all of a sudden, Peter can't identify himself enough with Christ. He opens up his letters that way. An apostle, Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1, same thing. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For Peter, it was a choice to be aligned with Jesus. It was important to him that not only was he aligned with Christ, but that people knew that he was a disciple of Christ. There seems to be this debate. I've heard people uh, debate this uh, recently. 
This whole idea about should we call ourselves Christians because there's such a negative connotation to that, or should we call ourselves followers of Christ, should we call ourselves disciples, right, because we don't want to offend anybody, and we don't want any negative connotations. I'm going to tell you right now, well, there's some things that you can't help that have negative connotations to it, Right? Like, have you ever, <laughs> like parents, or we, we have parents here tonight, right? So parents, like, when you go to name your first child, you run down the list of all those bratty kids you knew, and you're like, we're not naming them that. But I'm going to tell you, somebody has a bratty kid named after your child. You just can't help it. Now, the, the only exception is the name Jim. I, I don't know why, for whatever reason. That's a solid name. I, every Jim I've ever met, solid person right there. Great name. Usually great people associated with those, with those names. <laughs> but there's some things, the connotations, negative connotations. Here's what I think is important. I don't want to get caught up in getting a name that's going to offend somebody, but I know this. I want to align myself with Jesus. And that's where Peter got to. Peter says, listen, I want to align myself with Jesus. 1 Peter 4.16, he says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Peter found his identity in Christ. It changed. And it changed over time. He was originally, <laughs> when times got tough, my wife and I just had the privilege of uh, going over to, uh, to Europe. My brother-in-law works for a, a company, and they wanted to move him over to uh, London, just outside of London and, and Oxford. And um, they were going to be there for a year. They moved his whole family over there. And so I told my wife, I said, let's go. I said, we can go over there, and then we don't have to pay for a hotel. <laughs> I'm cheap that way. <laughs> And so <laughs> they got room. They only have five kids in a three-bedroom house. We'll sleep on the floor. And so we, so we, we got to go over there. It was a wonderful experience. We, one night we went, to, uh, we went to Paris, France. Never been to Paris, France. That was interesting. Uh, we, we went to this, uh, this d diner, all these diners that are outside, right? They have all these really nice tables outside. You can sit outside uh, of the restaurants. And we went to this Italian restaurant and... Uh, you can't, I can't, couldn't read anything on the menu, right? And so we're guessing, and uh, we could recognize pizza, so we're like, uh, pizza. <laughs> and so everything had been real expensive up until that point, right? Everything was expensive, and so when we saw these pizzas, and they were for $14, we're like, yeah, okay, for 14 bucks, it's probably, you know, this really small pizza. So we each ordered one and uh, found out that it was a full pizza. <laughs> Brought these humongous pizzas. <laughs> you American pigs, my goodness, calm down, right? <laughs> But it's funny, we, we, when we pay over there, they, uh, have, some, of, uh, some people here have these the new credit cards with a chip in them, right? And, and the chip on the credit card, and you slide your credit card in. You don't slide it like this. You stick it in the little slot, and it reads the chip. Well, they, over there, that's all they have. They don't swipe anything. They, they, they have the chip, and they've had the chip for a long time. As a matter of fact, what they do is they take it a step further. Their debit cards have personal ID numbers, and so do their credit cards. So you don't sign for anything. You put your card in, right, with the chip, and then you type in your personal number. You don't sign for anything. And so every time we went to pay, you know, I had a credit card without the chip. And so they had to swipe it, and then I had to sign for it. You could tell they're irritated by it, right? And then one guy just looked at us. He goes, you, you don't have the chip? And I'm like, no, we don't have the chip, he said, do you want somebody to steal your identity? I said, yes, we love it in America. We're handing out our identities all the time over in the U.S. He said, it's safer. I said, I understand it's safer. And I started thinking about that. It's true, right? We, we protect our identity. And here's what, I, here's what I want to challenge you tonight, that when we don't deny, when we don't take that step to deny ourselves and align our identity with Christ... Someone or something else makes that choice for us. When we don't choose to deny ourselves, we don't, when we don't choose to align our identity with Christ, the decision is made for us. Because our, our culture, our world, constantly hands out labels. And that's how they look at you, and that's how they label you, and that's how they categorize you, right? This is what I love about the argument about homosexuality in America is that people, and I, to me this sounds foolish, want to be identified by their sexual life. 
That sounds foreign to me. Like, I don't want anybody to call me a crueler from Casey's, right? I don't want to be identified by what I eat. But if we don't make that choice, if we don't deny ourselves and choose Christ as our identity, someone or something will. And Peter had aligned himself with Christ. In the gospel, Jesus is confronted by religious leaders. They come up to him and they're trying to trap him. And so they hand him a coin and they said, should we, or they, before they hand him a coin, they asked him, said, should we pay taxes, right? Trying to trip him up. And so Jesus asked for a coin. They give him a coin and he says, all right, what's, what's the signature on here? What's, what's the emblem? What's the likeness on here? They said, well, that's Caesar. And he said, well, give Caesar, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, Right? So if Caesar's likeness is on there, that's his. Give that to him. Pay taxes, in other words, is what he's saying. But I wonder if maybe the follow-up question that either wasn't written down or Jesus didn't bother to ask, but to me, a great follow-up question would be this. What insignia is on your heart? Because whatever insignia is on your heart, then that's your identity. That's who you are. And if it's Christ, then you have Christ. But if it's not, then it's something else. Who have you aligned yourself with? Who, who has your identity? What is your identity? What ID do you have stamped on your life? The second choice that, that Peter made was this. He chose his response. We read this, we talked about this scripture on Sunday. John 18, 10 says this, Then Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. So here they are. This is Malchus was his name that lost his ear. Here they are in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane and Peter just grabs the sword and lops this guy's ear off. Peter's response. What was Jesus' response? He picked up his ear, put it back on, and he willingly went with them. See, Peter was still doing what Peter wanted to do. Peter was still responding the way Peter wanted to respond. And Jesus said, no, no, this is, if you're going to follow me, this is how I want you to respond. We live in a world where we want to choose our response. Even those who follow Christ, it, it is about us. About what we feel justified in responding and the way we feel justified in responding. Here's the response of Christ, Matthew 5, 43 and 44. He said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Then in Matthew 5, 48, it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What Jesus is really saying here is this. He's saying, respond like me. Respond as I would respond. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, that takes supernatural power. Because there's something within us that wants us to respond to us selfishly. Like, I should be able to respond that way. Like, if something, someone does something awful to me, then I should be able to do something awful back to them. I've justified this in my own life, especially when it comes to family relationships. That seems to be the most difficult, right? When family does something to you, you're like, oh, it's, it's justified to punch them in the face. <laughs> it's justified to uninvite them to Thanksgiving, right? That's justified. I have an aunt. We're, not, are we record, we're recording this, aren't we? Oh, boy. All right, I'm going to tell you anyway. I have this aunt. I have several aunts. They all probably think I don't like them. Uh, I have this aunt that tests me on this, <laughs> She, she has these conversations with, with my mom. She's a, my mom's older sister. And, um, and she has these conversations. And she told my mom one time, she said, you know, I'm probably the best mother I've ever known. Okay. Well, at least she doesn't have a self-esteem issue. You can check that one off the list. But my mom says these things, and, and I just hear in the conversation that these words just beat my mom down. And, and I get upset at my aunt, right? And I want to respond the way Jim wants to respond to my aunt. But if I truly deny myself, then Jim doesn't have a response except for what Christ would respond or how Christ would respond, what Christ would do. And that's difficult. 
Mike Matheny, the uh, manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, yeah, he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Won 100 games and got knocked out in the first round. That's awesome. I love Mike. Mike is a Christian. I don't know if, if you know that or not. Born-again Christian. Uh, has a wonderful testimony. I don't know, how many of you have read his book, The Matheny Manifesto? If you have not read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's a, f- a wonderful book. It's not necessarily a Christian book, but he does not deny his faith within that book. It's powerful. In that book, he makes this statement. He said, it's the pictures that match your words. You ever get on Instagram and see all these other pictures, these pictures that are out here, and they don't really tell the whole story because you can fool people by pictures, right? Like, I I have had people take pictures of food. That's what I love when people take pictures of food, because that's interesting. So they take pictures of food, and then they post it, and they said, oh, we had this wonderful meal here. And then I'll travel to that area and go to the restaurant, and that one item on the menu looks great, but the rest of the restaurant should be condemned, right? But all you see is that one little wonderful thing, just a snapshot Matheny says here, listen, it's, it's those pictures in your life. It's your life that needs to match your words. That if you call yourself a follower of Christ, then I think what the world is looking for is that you respond like Christ. I don't think they expect you to walk on water, but they've heard enough stories about Jesus that they at least hope to see a little bit of that in you if you're calling yourself a follower of Christ. That's what it is right there. Came unscrewed a little bit. I'm too active up here. Move around too much. I read a tweet the other day from Rick Warren. He stated this. He said that in this next year, more people will die accidentally from taking selfies than from shark attacks. Man, where are people taking selfies at, right? More people will die from taking selfies. All right, let's get up here. It's the Grand Canyon behind us, kids. And there they go. I don't know. I just, I'm thinking, where are people taking selfies from? But that's where we're, we're involved in the selfie generation. And the selfie generation doesn't want to deny itself. It's about us. We we justify everything. We now live in a in a in a world where we justify being offended all the time. Can we just please take a time out with this? <laughs> Everybody's offended about everything, and I'm going to tell you, it's it, I, I wish I could say it's the world versus the church, but I'm going to tell you the whole thing. Everybody, church included, everybody's getting offended. It's ridiculous. We've reached a, a huge amount of being offended. I. I don't, I don't come from a large family. I, I am part of a family that has several large families in it. My, my brother has, I say large family. I, I, mean, I mean, the Duggars blew that term out the window. So, I mean, if you say someone has five kids, you're like, well, that's not large. I'll show you large. But, I mean, they have five kids. And then I, I've got a couple families that I know that have six or seven. And I, I saw somebody post once on, on Facebook that all these things that people had said to them because they have big families. And this lady just went on this rant. And I'm going, lady, who cares? I mean, you have seven kids. God's blessed you. That's awesome. If they offend you, you just, I mean, people are going to say what they're going to say. You can't stop them. Can you, I'm going to tell you right now, do you think Jesus and the apostles were offended? I was reading today about when they took Paul out and beat him so badly Right? That they thought he was dead. They went back in the temple. Remember that? They was like, oh, he's dead. And they walked away. Can you imagine being beat that bad that they thought you were dead? And he got up. He got, he got up and walked. And he didn't say, hold on a second. Before I come back in there, I'm just going to post on Facebook how offended I am that you guys beat me up. <laughs> Do you think Jesus and the apostles would have posted every time they got offended? On, no, they would not have. No. Here's what I think about America. We keep on talking about persecution, and I understand what people say when they say that. I'm not saying that we're not persecuted, but I just sometimes wonder if maybe it would be possible if, we'd be quit, if we would quit being offended long enough to really be persecuted. I 
All right, so just so you know, I'm not just talking about everybody else. I'll give you a prime example of myself. <clears throat> One of the things that we do at the Chapman House every year at Christmas is we, we like to decorate with a nativity scene. Not so much because we love it, but we want, it, it's, it's a way for our neighbors to tell them that we're Christians without actually having to interact with them and tell them that we are Christians. Right? It's like having a Christian bumper sticker. I don't need to evangelize. I have a bumper sticker and a t-shirt. I said that once and a, somebody came up to me like, I have witnessed to people. With, so don't be offended. If you've won people to the Lord with a t-shirt, praise God. Okay? All right. I'm not here to condemn you. Man, like we got to lighten up, don't we? Oh, come on. Remember now, I'm probably preaching to myself. The Lord's like, yeah, you need to lighten up. So we put the nativity scene out, and we used to, when we first started this, now we have the uh, cutout. Have you seen the cutouts made of wood? And you prop it up there, and you put the light behind it, or in the right direction, and then it's the shadow on your house. I love that. I really do. I bu- don't tell anybody, I bought mine at a Catholic store. It was on sale. I, I had a coupon. <laughs> they saw me coming, though, because I bought stuff there before. Like, you're the Protestant, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Is it the sticker on my car? <laughs> no, Catholics don't put nativity scenes in their yard. Okay. So anyway, so I bought it. I love it. It's awesome, right? Because I love the decoration because during the day you can see it, right? Not the shadow, but you can see the little cutout thing. I like that. And so, but before that, we used to have the Walmart plastic things. You remember that? Where you'd put a light bulb in Jesus' rear end. It was kind of weird. <laughs> a little awkward now I think about it. But you would, right? You'd put up in there and turn the lights on, right? And just put that out in front of your house. And so we'd have, we'd start out small. I mean, you got to start out with Jesus, right? It's awkward if you start with Mary and Joseph because they're staring at nothing, right? So you, you buy, I think the set comes Mary, Joseph, Jesus. So we bought Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and then we just added all these different th- parts to it, right? Like I mean, by the time we were done, I mean, we had like, <laughs> we had like a whole herd of sheep and cattle. I mean, we had enough. We were like, whoa, okay, calm down, right? And so we had all this out. And, uh, and we leave it up till January 1st, and then officially Christmas is over. January 1st, I go outside, and I get everything down. Well, I have two boys, and so they do it now, so that's why I had two kids. But, so they helped me, we get it down, right? And so it's over. So it was, a Jan- it was January 1st, I walked out there, and I was putting things away, and I looked, and I was like, I was counting the pieces, and like one of the pieces was, was gone. I'm like, where, what am I missing? And I realized... Baby Jesus was gone. Someone stole Jesus. Who steals Jesus, right? And they stole Jesus from me and my family, right out out from underneath our nose. Jesus was there in our front yard one day, and the next day, Jesus was gone. Someone took Jesus. And we had this neighbor next to us. He had a 16-year-old boy, and uh, he was a little different. Um, When my youngest son was probably about four or five, the 16-year-old came over to our house and he said, he goes, hey, he goes, Hunter is my son's name. He said, I'd like Hunter to come over and hang out with me. And he said, I want to show him my sword collection. Uh, I said, no, we're going to pass. He goes, well, why? I said, well, you're 16, he's four, and you said sword collection. <laughs> I said, I can show you uh, my Glock collection in my house if you want to come on in. So I knew it was him immediately. I knew it was him. And so I just marched right over there. I was like, I'm going to let him have it. Nobody steals Jesus from me. I was so ticked off, and I'm walking in the yard, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to let him have it. In the middle of that conversation with myself, Jesus goes, now let me get this straight. I just want to make sure this is all laid out before you get over there. This is the kid you've been praying for. You know, I prayed for him all right. The prayer is going to be different now. I can tell you that. Now, you prayed for him. You want him to know me. You've tried to influence him. You, 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 I'm, you've mowed their lawn. You've tried to do all these things, trying to open a door to have this conversation with him and all this kind of stuff. And so now you're going to trash all that. You're going to flush all that down the toilet and let him have it because he stole me. Well, it, it seems like it's a little different when you say it. <laughs> it always is, right? Well, no, I guess I'm not. Oh, okay. 
Because you can respond the way Jim would respond. That's your choice. But that's not really what I would have you do. And I know there are some here tonight that say, well, if he stole it, he should pay the price. You should have called the police and teach him a lesson and all that kind of stuff. And I understand that. I get that. I understand what you're saying by that. But for me, in that moment, it was Jesus to not do anything. And that was a tough choice. I value my Christmas decorations. <laughs> and he took it. It made me mad. But it's a choice to deny ourselves. To respond as Christ would respond. The third choice Peter had to make was he had to choose his will. Would it be God's will or his will? 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6 it says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done, is done with sin. As a, result, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. It's a powerful statement. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they keep abuse, and they heap abuse on you. Not your will, God's will. No matter what, whether they heap abuse on you, whether they make fun of you, ridicule you. Matthew 16, 21 through 25. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, I love this, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now again, this is Peter before Peter really denied himself. And it was about Peter's will, not God's will. And he says this, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Wow. Jesus brought it home right in that moment. Peter, this isn't about what you want to accomplish. Peter, this isn't about your political agenda. Peter, this isn't about you. This isn't about your identity. This isn't about the identity of, of, the, of the disciples. This is about what God wants, and it's his will. And Peter, if you truly want to follow me, then you need to deny all of those things that you're struggling with. Pick up the cross, pick up your cross, and follow me. In the book, Crash the Chatterbox, Steve Furtick says this about God's will. Don't let what you expected keep you from what God wants you to experience. Let me read that again. Don't let what you expected keep you from what God wants you to experience. God has plans for you that you know nothing about right now. That means he may take you down paths that seem to lead to nowhere. Woo, been there, done that, got the t-shirt for it, right? Where are we going? What are we doing? Don't get me wrong, it's, I, I think it's okay. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions. I, we're human, I, 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 we don't like the feeling of insecurity. We don't like not knowing. That's one of the reasons why I used to hate flying was because you sit in the seat and you don't see the dude driving the thing, right? You don't get a, a front seat, a window view of where we're going. You can only kind of see kind of where we've been. It's control. And Jesus says, listen, can you accept my will? Can, can you set aside what you want and your agenda and your will? And I'm going to tell you, I think that's one of the most difficult things in following Christ is to set those things down. I was talking to uh, 
the pastor the other night. I was talking to Dennis and Charlene and talking about just being a parent and letting go. Right, my son's a senior in high school and we're going through that process and I didn't realize it was going to be this difficult. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a helicopter parent, you know what I mean? But I love being around my sons. I love being around my kids. I, I, I don't know if they do or not, but I do. <laughs> and I question myself, have I done everything? I taught him all this that he needs to know. You know what? When they were about 11, 10 or 11, I realized I had not shown them how to pump gas. See, I grew up in a generation where someone didn't show you, you just kind of did it, right? If you didn't pump gas, you didn't get gas. I mean, I guess somebody would pump it for you, right? But I mean, we, I remember my sisters would never pump gas. We always had to pump gas. I started pumping gas when I was six because my older sisters were like, I don't like the fumes. But it's all right for your brother to inhale them and die. That's awesome. That's great. Okay, sure, I'll get out for you. But I look at my kids and, and I think, man, and God says to me, you, you got to let them go. See, I've got a plan. I, I've got a will for, for them and their lives, Jim. You can mess it up and, and try to interfere and do things your way. Or you can trust me. I think that's the same thing that goes for the church. I think if the church in America is not careful, the church in America can choose its will over God's. And if you don't believe that can happen, read the Old Testament and see if the nation of Israel didn't try to thwart God's will and make their own choices and do their own thing. We have terms like control freak in our world today, don't we? Helicopter parent, I use that. And we live in a world where we just, we want control and we don't deny ourselves. Here's a powerful verse. This is Galatians chapter 2, verses 20, verse 20. And here, I, I love this, so I always consider this a power verse. Electricity measured in 220, right? Okay, so I was thinking about that scene in Mr. Mom. He's like, so what are you wiring this with? 220? He goes, 220, 221, whatever it works. I don't know. That's an old movie. Maybe no one's seen it in a while, but it's pretty funny. Galatians 220. Here's a powerful verse. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If that isn't denial, <laughs> I don't know what is. Paul's saying, I no longer live. It's no longer about me. It's about Christ. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I read that and I think to myself, oh man, oh, to live that way. Paul was so fortunate to be able to, to get to that point in his walk with Christ. Oh, what a lucky guy. Can I tell you something tonight? That same power, that same process, that same experience can be yours. It can be all of ours. But it starts, it truly does start, it starts with a choice that we say, listen, I'm going to deny myself. I'm, it's no longer going to be about me. And I'm going to follow Christ. Now, I understand we live in a world where we have to pay bills and we have, to, we, we, we have doctor's appointments and we have mortgages and, and we have to pay car insurance. I understand, I understand that. We live in this world that demands our attention and, and pulls us all these different ways. But I think that in a world like that, it's even more important <laughs> for God to be at the center of it all and to be in control of it all. To deny yourself, to take up your cross, to be crucified with Christ, that is what real life is. There is power in denying ourselves. 
See, the question I have is this. Have you been experiencing that kind of power? And if you haven't, then why? Why? I mean, I ask the same of myself. There have been times where I've gone through periods in my life just recently where I just feel like God seems so distant, right? And I, I just feel like, man, I just, <clears throat> man, I want some affirmation somewhere, somehow. I, I'll take anything. Right, to the point where you're, you're, you're even willing to make it up, right? You're willing to read a scripture and go, oh, that's really God. You know what I mean? You're just trying to do whatever you can. It's like, all right, all right, this is, this is, this is God. He's really, really reaching out. He's really, really speaking to me. Been so desperate for that. But know that it comes back to me. Setting aside me. <laughs> Taking up the cross following him not that we owe him anything don't get me wrong not that we owe him anything this isn't a paying back or a payment but a response I want you to bow your heads tonight I want you to just sit quietly tonight right there in your chairs. In just a moment, I'm going to quit talking. I just want you to listen. I want you to listen to God tonight. I want you to hear from Him. This is a, it's a tough passage to unwrap. It's, I think it's even tougher to live out. But God has given us that power through his son and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so when I quit speaking, when I quit talking, hear God, hear God for what he says in this passage of scripture tonight to us.